gospel lesson this morning is taken again from the 18th chapter of Matthew. Find these verses on page 20 in the New Testament part of your pew Bible. And the reading begins at verse 21. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of the slave released him and forgave the debt. But... That same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii and seized him by the throat. He said, pay what you owe. And then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused, and then he went out and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. When we survey the religious and spiritual landscape of our world, we see a variety of religious and spiritual systems. Some are very old, like Judaism or Hinduism, which some argue is the oldest of all religious systems. Not quite so old is Buddhism and Christianity. But then the list of options grows quite long. In one of my internet searches, I learned that there are 4,200 different religious and spiritual systems. Now, we may think that this is new in our modern world to have so many choices. And it is true that many of those systems are relatively new. But actually, that's not quite true. For in the days of our faith ancestors, there were indeed other choices of a way to live your life. Our Hebrew faith ancestors knew folks who were polytheists for our their Canaanite neighbors had a variety of gods for all different areas of their life. By the time the Hebrews were in captivity in Babylon, Zoroastrianism was quite well established there, a dualistic system where light and dark were constantly at battle with one another. And when we read correspondence, the correspondence of the Apostle Paul, it becomes clear that to be a follower of Jesus meant choosing against worshiping the emperor or in some places against the worship of the goddess Artemis 
parenthesis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, is the temple to Artemis in Ephesus. Built on a hill, it literally loomed over that city. Also to follow Jesus meant you chose against one of the many mystery religions. So, there have always been a lot of choices, different kinds of spiritual systems, different kinds of religious traditions. But in each one of them, there is some understanding of what God is like. For today and the next two Sundays, I think the scriptures lift up for us some of the attributes of God. I think it's important for us to have beliefs and opinions about what God is like, not just for ourselves, but that we can talk with one another about our experience of God in our lives. So here it is for today. The affirmation of what God is like. Our God is a God who does things. In the late 1960s, the Presbyterian Church in the United States, that old southern branch that some of us grew up in, began a huge project of writing curriculum for Sunday school. There were books for two-year-olds on up through adults, and there was even a book for nursery caregivers, believing that even the very youngest children should be involved in some sort of Christian nurture. It was a massive project. The first book for adults was called The Mighty Acts of God. I suspect that maybe some of you might have studied that book. It's a great survey of the Bible. It's still a great study. In some of the beginning pages of that study, the author says this, The Bible is primarily God's story and the greatest drama ever enacted, and its chief actor is God. The Bible centers in God's mighty acts what God has done, is doing, and will do for us and for our salvation through Jesus Christ. How do we know God? We know God through what God does. Primarily through specific events of history as presented and interpreted in the Bible. And humans respond to God's action, interpreting it and understanding it through faith. Now, we may think that's kind of obvious, but it's not really. For in many other religious systems, the divine being is far off, uncaring, mostly, relatively unavailable, as if the divine back were just turned away from what goes on. Now, this is not a class in comparative religion, and therefore we will not now launch into a lecture on all the examples of all of those kinds of traditions. But what we are going to do is to look at two stories from the Bible today. I think in different ways they affirm our God as a God who acts. If you've been here at all the last few weeks, you know that we've been reading through the Exodus story, and so today the story continues. Hebrews are now actually going to escape from Egypt. You will remember that Moses got a call from God through the visible symbol of the burning bush, and then there were the ten plagues, which is this big power struggle between Yahweh and the Egyptian god Ra, and then the angel of death passed over, and finally he, Pharaoh relented, and the Hebrew people are on their way out of Egypt. Then, of course, Pharaoh changes his mind. He's sorry he ever made that decision. So he sends 600-plus chariots to follow the Hebrews. The people get afraid, and they rail against Moses. What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians and, than to die in the wilderness. Moses calmly replies, Do not be afraid. Stand firm 
and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. Ah, a mighty act of God. What will it look like? Well, we find out. God has been leading the Hebrews by the movement of two pillars. One, a pillar that looks like a cloud, and the other, a pillar that looks like fire. Well, the cloud-like pillar moves so that it provides a buffer between the Hebrews and the Egyptians. Then comes that big wind and moves the water. You know, we, you've seen this part on TV. Moves the waters back, and the Hebrews begin to walk forward through the sea, but on dry land. But the chariots are in hot pursuit, but panic ensues. But when the Egyptian chariots reach the riverbed, their wheels get stuck in the mud. The waters come back to their normal place, and all the Egyptians are drowned. It's a great story. It made a great movie. <laughs> But what's important, of course, is the affirmation or the description of how this happened. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind. The Lord threw the Egyptians into a panic. The Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The Lord saved Israel that day. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did. These are the mighty acts of God. They show us the depth to which God will go to rescue us from slavery and to bring us into freedom. This is our God. Well, the mighty acts of God continue in the biblical narrative and they culminate in the New Testament story of Jesus Christ, the mightiest act of God. Today, we read again from the 18th chapter of Matthew. Matthew has five big teaching sections in his telling of the gospel. Chapter 18 is the fourth, and it's all about the church and how we live together in the church and settle issues in the church. And last week, we talked about community. And today, the issue is forgiveness. Peter says probably with a big sigh in his voice. <gasps> How many times do I have to forgive? Seven? Which would seem like a good number. Jesus answered, no. Seventy-seven, or as some manuscripts have, 70 times seven, which is a really big number. Peter must have had this incredulous look on his face, like, that many? But immediately, Jesus launches into a story. A story in which a king is reconciling his accounts with his slaves, and one of his slaves owes 10,000 talents, and he can't pay. Now, 10,000 talents is a huge sum of money. Some commentators will tell us that it's about 15 years' worth of wages. So there's no way this guy's going to be able to pay this debt. And so what does the king do? Well, the first king orders him thrown into prison, but then the guy begs, and so what does the king do? Something very unkingly. He forgives the whole debt. It's a huge debt. Forgiven. Well, in the next part of the story, which you heard the forgiven slave leaves the king's presence, he soon meets up with another slave who owes him a hundred denarii. Now, denarii is an average one day's wage. So this guy owes him a hundred days worth of wages. Small when compared to the 150 years of wages about that the other guy owes. But we heard what has happened. There's no mercy or forgiveness here. The slave put his fellow slave into prison. He offers nothing. Well, there are witnesses to this, other slaves. They're distressed, maybe angry. And quite frankly, they tattle on him. They report him to the king, who now seizes him and puts him into prison. 
Well, the story obviously is about forgiveness, and we could have a long conversation about how that plays out. But notice that the action begins with the choice of the king or the Lord, who of course is to remind us of God. This is how God acts. Maybe a small thing compared to pillars of cloud and fire and pushed back seas and swamped chariots. But if we're the one in debt, whether it's 150 years worth of debt or 100 days worth of debt, it's a big deal in our lives to be forgiven. And of course, then, what one of us is not in debt to God. And the mighty act of God's mercy is a big thing. A Bible quote that might seem applicable in this story of God's action and forgiveness is what we often call the golden rule. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus called it the second of the great commandments. But the truth is, we don't often do what God does. We don't, we try to just choose stuff that looks after ourselves. Barbara Brown Taylor suggests this variation, do unto others what you would have God do unto you. This is the affirmation for today, and I believe it is good news. Our God is a God who does things. But there's a challenge, a hard part. And that comes, of course, when we do not see or understand what God is doing. A family member or friend is ill and we do not see the healing we've prayed for. There may be some other kind of burden or decision and we do not see light on a path. If we look in the world, the world seems to be consumed with violence and peacemakers make no progress. Leaders in cities of all sizes, countries, nations often seem focused on their own gain and the common good is not sought after. And we wonder, honestly, where are God's mighty acts? Where are God's mighty acts among the troubles of the world? And the answer on some days, we don't know. Some days, we don't know. Because we don't see any one of us what God is doing. This, of course, is where faith comes in. This is when faith helps us affirm that our God is a mighty God, a God who acts, who showers us with mercy and grace, who rescues us and forgives us even when and especially when we don't see it. But it is this God who is leading us into the future. Shall we go?